Um, hi, everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon. Uh, good evening. Uh, we're uh, very happy that you uh, have decided to join us uh, for our session on measurement and uh, more specifically measurement issues in psychological science. Uh, my name is Estel Maasse. I'm a PhD student in uh, methodology and statistics at Tilburg University uh, in the Netherlands. And today, um, Eiko Fried, Andrea Stuvebelt, Jessica Flake, and I will be presenting talks on uh, various issues related to measurement uh, that we found in our research efforts. I will um, not spoil the contents of these talks uh, too much. I will say that our talks hopefully will convey how crucial uh, it is to give attention to measurement in your own research or when peer reviewing research or when consuming research. Um, the order of the presentations uh, will be Aiko, myself, Andrea, and Jessica. And we would like to ask you to ask your questions in the uh, Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we will get to those um, after each talk. And if we uh, don't have time to answer all questions, then um, I am sure that our panelists will be happy to do so via text in that text box as well. Um, without further ado, I would like to uh, introduce to you our first speaker, uh, Dr. Aiko Fried. Uh, Aiko is an associate professor in clinical psychology at Leiden University in the Netherlands. Um, he will be talking uh, today uh, to us about uh, depression, more specifically in the limited progress of the research surrounding depression. Um, if you're ready, um, I would like to give the floor to you, uh, Aiko. Go ahead. Thanks. Thank you so much. I hope everybody can hear me okay. Welcome out there, all the screens far, far away. Uh, thanks for uh, organizing this. Semester and um, yeah, I'll try to keep this general. Um, I'm aware I'm setting up the symposium here. I will be talking about a construct, a major depression, but I hope that all you out there can try to think along if the things I mention apply to your constructs that you're all working on, whether that be personality, cognitive abilities, grit, or or uh, some, some other constructs. <clears throat> um, right, I'm publishing a preprint Monday, if all things go well, uh, together with Jessica Flake and Don Robineau. And uh, this um, talk is based a bit on, on this preprint and a bit on the work we've been doing. Um, Don Robineau has called this preprint my manifesto because I've been working on depression measurement for a few years and Don has been teasing me since 2015 to finally write this up. And uh, we found a nice outlet now, so I'm gonna give you the best of uh, not, not necessarily my own work, but the best of depression measurement. Um, first off, depression. Uh, I'm not a clinical psychologist. Why should I care about your talk? I go, well, I'll tell you why. Depression is super common, highly prevalent mental disorder, very debilitating. Many people, suicide rates are very high. Comorbid disorders are very high and so forth. It's a severe recurrent disorder, and it's very costly to uh, families, people affected lives, universities, the economy, and so forth. Second reason why you should care is that I'm going to argue that depression is the most commonly assessed construct ever across time and space in all sciences. Why do I say this? There's a 2014 paper in Nature that looked at the 100 most cited papers across all sciences ever. And three of those papers are depression scale validation papers. Uh, 1960, 1961, 1977, uh, the Hamilton scale, the Beck scale, and the CESD by Radloff. Uh, I looked into this last year. They had about 81,000 combined citations. There's got to be many more today. And each of these scales has been cited in over 141 disciplines each on the web of science. All right, I mentioned this already. Uh, here is Jessica Flake and me meeting a few years ago, trying to look into the validity evidence of depression. Um, Don Robino couldn't make it to this photograph, but um, that's what I will do today, talk about validity evidence a little bit. Um, all right, for all of you out there who don't know how to measure depression, what do we do? Well, we give people either a questionnaire, um, similar to an intelligence test, or we interview people clinically, but no matter how we do that, these questionnaires or questions have a number of symptoms. How sad are you right now? Uh, how pessimistic have you been last week? Uh, are you worried about the future? These sort of questions, uh, suicidal ideation, insomnia, and so forth. So we assess them, and then we add them up to one score. 99.999% uh, of all papers do that. 
this score can either be a sum score, uh, you have, I don't know, 47 points, or it can be a zero one score, you have depression or you don't have depression. And then we use the score as a dependent variable, predictor, moderator, mediator, and so forth. Common uses for such scores um, are many. The most common ones are probably to diagnose patients, yes, no, uh, for case control studies, uh, I don't know, comparing the genetics of people with depression versus without depression, and tracking treatment over time. Uh, but again, many personality psychology or social psychology studies will also just try to control for depression, uh, adding it as a co-founder, potential co-founder, for example, which is also another common use. Now, as Esther said, we want to talk about the issues today. Uh, so I have a box of issues for you today. Um, I'm going to talk about five things, I think, uh, depending on how, how I'm going to do the time. And yeah, let's dive right in. So there are over 280 different scales for depression that have been used in the literature in the last 100 years. Many are still in use today. Uh, a recent review paper identified 19 different measures used as primary outcomes in 30 clinical trials for depression. It's a complete disaster. Um, there is the very first sentence of the most cited depression scale published 1960, 60 years ago, says the appearance of yet another rating scale um, may seem unnecessary since there are so many already in existence and many of them have been extensively used. Of course, after Hamilton, many, many, many dozens further uh, depression scales were developed, used, uh, validated, and so forth. Uh, researchers in their studies usually use one single scale. There are some exceptions, but the norm is you use one scale, the BDI, the Hamilton, the back, and so forth. But then you draw general conclusions about depression. We found that depression is related to female gender, um, which relies on the assumption that scales are interchangeable. Doesn't matter what scale you use, you would find the same uh, result. But that's not the case. So you see me here at the bottom right during my early uh, postdoc, my first postdoc, uh, it was a while ago. And um, I looked into this question, how interchangeable scales are, this is the paper. Um, what you can see here is I looked at the seven most commonly used depression rating scales uh, in different colors here. And we identified being very conservative, 52 different symptoms. Um, for example, the CSD, the green scale on the right side, you can see lots of green dots on the right side. This means that these symptoms appear only in the CSD and in none of the other six scales. So there's massive differences in terms of content. Um, you, you can look at this more in the paper. I'm not gonna do the details of this graph today. 40% um, of all symptoms appear only in a single scale and uh, only 12% of all symptoms appear across all instruments. And the summary of this is, yeah, I couldn't put this in the paper, unfortunately, but this um, it's bad, I think, because if you do research on one paper on one scale, it might probably not generalize for another scale because you really measure different constructs with these different scales. So fundamentally, got agreement on how to conceptualize and measure depression, and uh, of course, with all these different scales, it opens the door for for exploitation, uh, questionable research practices, and so forth because you could just assess two scales and report the one where you find effects because the scales are often correlated 0.4 or 0.5 with each other. Okay, ICO. Yes, these are all scales and so forth, but what about the DSM? What about the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders that has nine symptoms for depression in there? This is used for clinical interviews. Clearly that is better than these all these scales that we've been talking about, ICO, right? Okay, here are the nine symptoms of depression in the DSM. Um, those of you who look at this right now might see the oddity that there are eight ors in there. It's always a little weird, I think, psychometrically to ask questions with or uh, in them. You might also notice that three of these questions are literal opposites. You sleep too much or too little, yes or no. Uh, item three is my favorite, increase in weight or appetite or decrease in weight or appetite. Yes or no is the answer. These are yes or no questions. <clears throat> um, and um, I think we calculated that there are about 10,300 combinations of these symptoms that all uniquely qualify for a diagnosis of depression. Um, 
So there's lots of heterogeneity. Uh, you can see 10,300 patients, none of which has the same symptom profile, all of which have the identical diagnosis of major depression. And we um, looked into an, this empirically. Uh, there's a new paper out last week, actually, from uh, Lorenzo, Lorenzo Luarses and, um, and me, where we replicate this finding here. But the main gist is that these symptom profiles are not just mathematical speculation, they are realized in patients. So here we looked at 3,700 patients and we identified over 1,000 unique symptom profiles just using the DSM symptoms. Um, so there are massive difference between people and that raises the question what it means to have 14 points on a rating scale, for example. Psychometrics, uh, Jessica and the other panelists will talk about this more, but you can imagine that given that these scales were developed in the 60s and most of them have not been updated at all, the Hamlet scale is still untouched, has the same items, the same content, everything has remained the same. Of course, these scales have terrible psychometric properties. Um, for example, they're all multidimensional. Um, everything between two and seven factors have been extracted. Replicational factor stru structure is terrible. And the scales also lack temporal measurement and variance meaning they measure different constructs over time in the same population, which is a big no-no in psychometrics. Uh, another thing, if you look at these items from these scales, what you do not see is the graph I show you here because I simulated the data on my computer. Right, this is the case if you have um, sick people and healthy people, and it's a category, measles, for example, very few people have a little bit of measles, right? You have measles or you're healthy, you get this distribution. But for depression, this is real data set here of, I don't know, 30,000 people. For depression, you get somewhat of a normal distribution or a slightly skewed distribution. And so finding a sort of proper cutoff here is, is quite arbitrary. Nonetheless, case control studies are the norm and we categorize people into ones and zeros usually, um, which is simply not... Uh, called for looking at data. Oh, yeah, this is the Hamilton rating scale. These are two and a half thousand people. All of these items are added up and I simply visualized the correlations here for you. You can see that item 17 correlates negatively with many, many other items. This is not negatively phrased. This is how the scale was designed. And yet we add item 17 to the other items and have been doing so for 61 years. It's really quite remarkable. And so red, sorry, red uh, edge here means negative correlation, green means positive correlation. Uh, overall, uh, yeah, psychometric quality is very low and scales are also not used as intended. For example, Hamilton said in his 1960 paper, do not use my scale for diagnoses. My scale is only for severity in already diagnosed patients, but we use it universally today to establish diagnostic uh, prevalence rates. Uh, Hamilton also said, don't use my sum score of the scale, use four separate scores, make four subscales, but nobody does that uh, today. Transparency. So looking at the Hamilton scale here, uh, the Hamilton scale exists with six items, seven items, nine items, 13 items, 16 items, 17 items, 21 items, 24 items, 31 items, and 34 items. All of these versions have been translated into dozens, or many have been translated into dozens of languages. So there's probably, I don't know, 5,000 versions of the Hamilton scale out there. For measurement, it's really important to know what scale people used. And so with, together with a master student of mine, Linus Neumann, we randomly drew 100 papers from clinical journals using the Hamilton as primary outcome. 40% did not provide any information on which version of the Hamilton was used. Um, and only 8% justified why they used the Hamilton in the first place. The last point is integrator reliability. So you send in the DSM-5 field trials, each person, they sent thousands of people with mental disorders to two clinicians who were blind to each other. And the two clinicians gave each person a diagnosis. And then you calculate the correlation, the integrator reliability of these clinicians. There were many, many clinicians and many, many patients. And for a major depressive disorder, reliability was among the lowest of all mental disorders with a pooled uh, kappa of 0.28. Um, I, yeah, I don't even know how, how to call 0.28 kappa. I think it's below the lowest threshold in the book. So that would be abysmal or something like that um, in a textbook. Um, 
I'm going to skip this so we have plenty of time for uh, other talks. You can just trust me that uh, point 0.28 interrate reliability is abysmal, especially when it comes to making important choices for people's lives. Um, you can look this up in the slides I send around later. Basically, read, I'm going to do this for 10 seconds. Uh, I simulated data here on the left side. You have the true prevalence for depression. So ones are depression, yes, zero are depression, no. I used the prevalence of 30% and I simulated two clinicians with a couple of 0.28 on the right. Again, one is diagnosis, uh, zero is no diagnosis. And all the reds are disagreement among clinicians with a couple of 0.28. And that's not where we wanna to be today when it comes to diagnosing mental health problems. Uh, my summary slide for the day, that's if you only pay attention for one slide today, uh, this is the one. All right, um, so it's, it looks pretty bad, unfortunately. Um, knowledge about depression is largely based on studies with a specific scale, one scale, meaning there's huge issues about generalizability and replicability because so many scales exist and they all differ from each other. Most commonly used scales today, the Hamilton is still the most commonly used scale in antidepressant trials today. 92% of over 550 recent trials use the Hamilton as primary outcome. But it's from the 50s, from the 60s, and um, it's not a good scale. And uh, scales and also the, these own criteria like basic psychometric properties such as unidimensionality and measurement invariants. So in the paper, we talk about ways forward a little. Um, there are many, the most important one to me is fund measurement research. And don't tell people like us who try to publish measurement research that you should publish it in small specialized journals. Because people who read small specialized measurement journals know about these problems already. These are not the people we need to talk to. Uh, we need to talk to the broad fields of folks. We need to stop the measurement management attitude that we have in the field that measurement isn't important. Measurement is the heart of science, also psychology. We need iteration. Scale validation is an ongoing process that requires updating. It's, it's the idea to make a scale and then just be done with it after a small validation study is ridiculous to me, quite frankly. And we need epistemic iteration. I strongly recommend the book by Hesok Chang called Inventing Temperature, in which he talks about the possibility of informing theory from fallible measures, which then again informs the measurement and so forth in a nice positive cycle. Thanks to Jessica and Don for the tremendous help on this paper, and thanks for you for paying attention. I don't know if you're in Europe and then it's late or where you are, but uh, thanks for joining us today. And I'm looking forward to the other three talks in the symposium. Thank you, Aiko. Um, I'm going to check the Q and A. There are no open questions um, at this point. I do have a question. If you're open to it, it's a more of a general question. Maybe I was naive, I, I was naive. Um, I thought if there's one psychological construct that we know that we can measure, it is depression, right? It, I think this is a general thing that you might hear, uh, hear a lot. Um, and it's not the case, apparently. It's abysmal, um, or as you said, a complete disaster. Um, my question is a bit more general. Are there constructs that do better than depression in this sense? Yeah, I think, so I think, um... I gave a longer talk on this this morning. My view is that mental disorders might not be real categories in nature. That doesn't mean they don't exist. I just mean that the categorization is somewhat arbitrary. And I think the goal of in clinical psychology and psychiatry is to come up with phenotypes that are maximally clinically useful. And I think a specific spider phobia is maximally clinically useful because if you tell me Esther, you have spider phobia. I know what symptoms you have. I know your etiology most likely. And I know that 10 sessions of CBT are gonna be, or behavioral therapy are gonna help a lot. But if you say you have depression, I know next to nothing about you. Um, and I don't know what symptoms you have. I don't know your etiology. I don't know what treatment I, rec I should recommend. And so um, I think specific phobias are much easier to measure, much clearer, crisper phenotypes with more uh, yeah, information behind them. That makes sense, thanks. Um, at the brink, we also have a question in the Q&A and we have time, so I'm gonna ask it to you. Um, you've shown that the different scales um, tap different aspects of depression, possibly. 
uh, but empirically, do uh, the major correlates of depression replicate across scales? Yeah, that's a super interesting question, uh, Andrew. Thanks for, for asking that. So the empirical data on this is very uh, scarce because most folks have not run two or three, four measures in their studies. Uh, that makes sense. It's a lot of burden for patients to fill out these questionnaires or for clinicians to do multiple interviews. And so, of course, for feasibility reasons, we haven't done measurement research in this area. There are some pharmaceutical companies that have started running three or four depression scales in their clinical trials. I think often with not the best intentions, um, if you look at these studies, we can see that uh, scales respond quite differently to certain treatments. And that makes sense because some scales are quite heavy on somatic symptoms, for example, but antidepressants often cause somatic complaints in patients. And so as a pharmaceutical company, for example, you don't want to give them a scale with lots of somatic symptoms because they often increase, sleep problems increase, uh, lack of libido increases and so forth. So I've been... Uh, trying to get this funded, Andrew, but it's really difficult. What we would need is a large scale study across, I don't know, somewhere, let's say 100,000 people who fill out five or six questionnaires on depression and a large number of constructs such as uh, gender, uh, I don't know, impairment and so forth, personality neuroticism. So we can see how stable from a nomological net perspective, the relations between depression constructs measured by different scales and other important constructs are that we know to be somewhat related to depression. My wild guess is that there would be considerable variability, but we honestly don't know. There's no data at the moment to yeah. Thanks uh, again, Aiko. Uh, I'm going to move on uh, to the next talk, which is me. Um, let me share my screen real quick. There you go. Okay, so... Um, like I said, um, my name is Esther Massa. Uh, today I will be presenting a project uh, that I've been working on with my uh, supervisors and uh, with a colleague of mine, uh, Damiano uh, Durso. And I'm giving him a shout out um, right away because uh, he and I have spent countless hours assessing many articles in psychology uh, on their use of and reporting of uh, measurement invariance. And this study is just as much his as it is mine. Um, our study is a descriptive study, uh, and before I uh, delve into it, I first want to give a short introduction, a short summary regarding uh, what measurement and variance testing entails and why it is important. Now, let's say uh, we have a researcher, and that researcher is interested in compliance to COVID-19 guidelines. Uh, compliance with COVID-19 is not directly uh, measurable. Uh, not directly observable. And as such, uh, to measure it, the researcher decides to use a scale composed of three items uh, that are self-reported. And these items measure uh, keeping six feet distance, washing your hands and using face masks. Um, this is what you can see here represented in this uh, measurement model uh, with the factor compliance to COVID-19 guidelines on top. And the researcher is specifically interested in comparing compliance to COVID-19 guidelines across American and Dutch people. Uh, to do so, they would traditionally take a survey of these three items in both samples. They would calculate a mean score or a sum score uh, for each subject and then conduct uh, some statistical analysis like a t-test to see whether these two samples differ significantly on compliance. Now, the issue is when we add up the scores of the items uh, to a sum score, to a mean score, we implicitly assume that the scale is measured uh, the same in both groups, or that, in other words, measurement invariance holds. And uh, there are a few ways to test for measurement invariance. For the uh, sake of time, I'm only going to discuss measurement invariance in a context of confirmatory factor analysis uh, in this presentation. And this appears also to be the most common way that researchers assess measurement invariance. Now, measurement invariance is tested in steps of which the first step is assessing configural invariance. And this means that the measurement model is the same across groups or that um, the same variables are measured by the same factor. So this means that configural non-invariance occurs when the measurement model is not equal. And we see here, for example, that uh, wearing a face mask is indicative for compliance to COVID-19 guidelines uh, for the Dutch, but not for the Americans. Then, if configural invariance holds, 
the next step is to test for metric invariance or uh, whether factor loadings are the same across groups. And what you do is you constrain each item's factor loading here displayed by the uh, lambdas to be the same across the groups. And then you test model fit. Um, this model fit of metric invariance, uh, you compare that to the fit of the configural invariance model. And um, the whole reason that we want these factor loadings to be invariant across groups is um, because the factor loadings are um, an indication of the strength of the relationship between each item and the factor. And if there's non-invariance, as you can see here in the third item, um, the relationship between the individual score on that item and the factor differs across groups. Um, this can be represented also by two regression lines, as you see here. Um, these regression lines should overlap, but um, as you can see here, the slopes are different. That is that loading uh, difference. Now, if all is well and metric invariance holds, we can check whether scalar invariance holds. And um, what we do then is we check whether the item intercepts are the same. So what we do is we keep the factor loadings, uh, which are here still represented uh, by the lambdas, constrained to be the same across groups. But now uh, we also added some intercept parameters that you can see here by the news. And we constrain those to be equal across groups as well. Now, again, we compare the model fit with that of the metric invariance fit, and we assess whether um, scalar invariance holds. If scalar invariance would not hold, as can be seen here with the third intercept again, um, it would mean that there is a consistent over or under estimation uh, for the entire group on the factor, uh, regardless of what you score on your COVID compliance um, factor. So as you can see here, there is an intercept difference between the groups, even though the lines um, should overlap. So to summarize, if we want to compare groups on the compliance to COVID-19 scale, we have to be sure that the scale functions equivalently across groups. And uh, to safely do so, measurement invariance must hold. Now, if we would um, like to estimate mean differences between groups on a certain scale, like you would, for instance, do uh, with a t-test or with an ANOVA, uh, we have to make sure that scalar invariance holds so that the intercepts are equal. Now, if um, the hypothesis of measurement invariance is rejected. Um, it does not necessarily mean that you should stop your analyses, give up on comparing the groups altogether. Uh, what you could do is you could use uh, modification indices to identify which item or items function differently across the groups, and you can allow them to uh, vary among them. This is possible as long as there is a sufficient number of items um, and the model uh, does not become too non-invariant. Um, that was my short introduction on measurement invariance, and our goal with our study was pretty simple. Uh, we wanted to find out uh, whether it happens, or basically uh, we were interested in whether researchers that are interested in group comparisons um, and use psychological scales, how often and do they actually um, assess their scales for measurement invariance? This was the um, main research question of our study. Now, our study focuses on two things. Uh, we were interested in studies that made comparisons between groups or over time. That means groups like uh, control and treatment, male and female, pre-intervention, at intervention or follow-up. And we were interested in studies that measured psychological scales or psychological constructs that are measured by scales. And um, the way that we defined those was by including all scales um, that adhere to either of the following things. So, we included any scale that was measured by at least three items and then had a reference to a validated scale. So for example, if depression was measured, we uh, would find a reference to uh, the BDI, for example. Uh, any psychometric properties were reported uh, that could be that um, they mentioned that they do a factor analysis or if they, um, that didn't happen, then uh, we would also include scales that reported some form of internal consistency measure like um, a Chromax alpha usually. Now, any comparisons across groups or over time that had such a scale should technically have checked for measurement invariance in the groups. Now, we only selected articles that had open data. So our study contains a reporting step, but we also have the availability to reproduce the results uh, from these studies if they have done a measurement invariance check because they share their data. 
if they did not do a measurement invariance check, then maybe uh, we could do so with the data that they shared. Uh, first, I will discuss the reporting part of our study. So we chose uh, two well-known journals in psychology to sample from, Psychological Science and PLOS One. First, we sampled all articles published in Psychological Science in 2018 and 2019 that shared our data. That were 213 articles. And to keep it equal, we also sampled 230 articles from PLOS One from 2018 and 2019, all of them um, open data. Now, many of these articles contained either multiple studies or multiple comparisons within a study. So this actually ended up being more than 1,800 um, studies or comparisons in total. But uh, not all of them were relevant or eligible for our study. So of those 1,800 um, something studies, some dropped out because they used non-human data uh, or because it was a simulation study or a meta-analysis or a theoretical paper. Then some studies dropped out because uh, they didn't make any group comparison um, or they, uh, that meant that they used one sample or maybe they um, had multiple groups, but they didn't do any statistical comparison between the groups. Then some studies uh, didn't use a scale. And um, that could be that um, they only used one item, for example, but it could also be that they had a scale, uh, but that, that they tested the items from a scale separately. And then um, finally, some studies dropped out because they did not have a reflective scale. And by a reflective scale, we mean um, any scale that combined multiple items into either a sum score or a mean score, but then did not adhere to our definition of a psychological scale. So that means no reference to previous scales, no psychometric properties and no internal consistency measures given. Now, we ended up with 50 and 46 articles for a total of 912 comparisons. And we will keep our sample split on these two journals. And I'm going to show you simple bar plots for the results. Like I said, um, this is a descriptive study. Uh, we have not performed any statistical tests. And before I show you the main result on measurement invariance, I would like to emphasize another quite interesting result. We checked whether authors used an ad hoc scale or whether they used an existing scale. And we defined uh, existing scales as scales that had a reference to a previous study or a previous validation study in which the scale was used. Um, and an ad hoc scale could be scales that were either completely made up by the researchers. It could also be existing scales that had items added, uh, changed, removed. And um, yeah, as you can see, quite a large, large proportion and even the vast majority of the comparisons in psychological science were done with these ad hoc scales. Um, there's nothing technically um, necessarily wrong with an ad hoc scale, of course, but if you change the scale in any way, the proper way to go about it is to do a validation study to check if the questionnaire, the thing that you use to measure still measures the same thing as it did before. And we did not find any evidence for that in our sample. Now onto the main result. Again, we have 912 comparisons across groups or time measuring a construct. Technically all 912 of them should have done measurement invariance testing, or if they could not do it, um, if they did not do it because they, for example, had a very small sample size, then they should have at the very least uh, reported um, that it was not possible to do so and how that limits the interpretation of results. So, of all 912 times a group or time comparison was made on a reflective scale, only 41 times measurement invariance was reported on, which is um, almost 5%. So that's quite problematic, I would say. Uh, also note that we interpreted this question quite broadly. So even if they only reported that um, there was measurement invariance without any additional information, they were still included in this yes category here. Now, um, we wanted to investigate that 5% of our sample um, that did report on measurement of variance a bit further. So we're gonna drop out all the purple studies here and um, taking only those comparisons that reported on measurement of variance, we are left with 34 comparisons for plus one across four articles. Um, so as you can see here, there's a lot of dependency as well, right? So uh, one article here accounts for 30 of those 34 comparisons. Um, and we have seven comparisons across um, three articles for um, psychological science. Now, if you look deeper into these articles mentioning something about measurement invariance, uh, we find that in PLOS One, uh, 
Uh, for two comparisons, it is reported that scalar invariance holds, for 10 there is partial, and for 22 it is unclear. And these 22, it means that the authors mentioned some form of measurement uh, invariance holds, but we do not know which level. Um, psychological science has five metric, one scalar, one not reported. Um, yeah, this result is quite problematic, right? Uh, even if we assume that this partial invariance result also allows for a proper mean estimation because um, partial invariance means that some items are freed and some items are constrained. Even if we assume that these allow for uh, proper mean measurements, only 13 out of 912 comparisons have reported adequate information on measurement invariance and actually found that the appropriate level of measurement invariance holds to um, make these mean comparisons. So quite damning, I would say. Uh, even though group or time comparisons occur often in research, uh, we found less than 5% actually checked or reported. If they report, um, it's often unclear which level and often if the level is not um, enough. Yeah, and finally, poor reporting standards were found overall. We had a quite a hard time finding if um, the scale that was used was validated, uh, if and how many items were added or removed, how many items were in a scale, what measurement the uh, scale was, the sample sizes per group, etc. cetera. Okay, that was the reporting part and the reproducibility part. Um, in this part, we tried to reproduce um, the measurement invariance checks for those studies that did them but also perform measurement invariance checks for those studies that technically had to do so, but did not. And um, I think you can imagine this takes a lot of time, uh, so much time that we did not finish in time for this talk. Um, luckily, before performing this study, we also did a pilot study on both the reporting and the reproducibility part. And I'm going to um, go through these results quickly now. Um, in our pilot study, we had three journals, uh, PLOS One, Psychological Science, and also the Journal of Judgment and Decision Making. We sampled 60 articles, so 20 from each. All of them indicated that they shared their data. In these 60 articles, we found 118 comparisons, of which 36 were group time comparisons with a psychological scale, uh, to, according to our definition of scales. Um, for those 36, we wanted to do a measurement invariance check. So even though all of them indicated to have open data uh, for only 30 comparisons, we could actually find uh, and open the data. Um, then of those 30, 25 had interpretable data. So that means uh, variables had names that we could understand. The information was interpretable. Then uh, for 15 of those, we could actually run a measurement invariance analysis. In the others, um, either the sample size was too small or the model did not converge because uh, it was too complex. In um, 11 of those, measurement invariance held, and in six of those, the level of measurement invariance that held was actually okay uh, estimating mean differences between groups and being able to say that the differences that you found uh, are not due to measurement differences in the construct. Um, so our conclusion for this part is that even uh, if the study states that they share their data, it's not guaranteed to be actually shared or interpretable or usable. If it is usable, the measurement invariance checks often fail to achieve proper measurement invariance levels. Um, so this means that we cannot be certain whether uh, found group differences are actually due to group differences or that they also uh, measure um, measurement artifacts. Our study has a few limitations, of course. Uh, our main limitation is that our inclusion criteria were quite strict, especially related to what we classified under our uh, psychological scale. So there were around 400 scales that we found in our study that measured some form of human behavior, uh, but they were not included as psychological scales here because they did not adhere to our definition. And many of these scales were uh, behavioral tasks in experiments, uh, for example, when reaction time was measured. Uh, we also compared only categorical groups like treatment versus control. We only use open data meaning that our sample is not very representative. And I think one can make the argument that researchers that share their data are also more aware of people possibly analyzing that data um, and that they are more careful in reporting. So that could mean that the situation for articles that do not share their data um, could maybe even be worse. Our sample was quite small. We didn't um, start out small, but uh, as you could see, studies kept dropping out. And in the end, uh, yeah, we have results across seven articles, which is not a lot. Uh, the data is nested and statistical tests here would be um, underpowered. Uh, 
but I want to end on a more positive note um, because there are things that can be done. Uh, if you're a researcher comparing groups or time points on a psychological construct, it's clear, right? Please do a measurement and variance test. It's super easy to do in R uh, with the LaVam pack package. And if you can't do it, please report why. Share your data, but also please share your code. Uh, we're very happy with researchers sharing their data, but for reproducibility purposes, it is necessary to share your code as well. Um, please prefer validated scales. Uh, don't just add or remove items. If you do add or remove items, make sure that you do a validation study. Check for measurement and variance. Check that what your um, that your construct still means the same thing as it did. Um, for reviewers or consumers of research, please be critical of measurement reporting in articles and see uh, whether enough information is reported. If not, and you're a reviewer of a study, ask for more information on measurement properties. I personally, I don't think there's any malice from people not reporting measurement invariance checks, right? I just think uh, this is a thing that many people don't think about of even doing. Uh, they don't know it's important. They don't know why it's important. And um, I'm now thinking I should also add another heading for um, educators asking them to uh, educate their students on measurement invariance. Um, I think making people aware will uh, help a lot. Um, if I can leave you today with the knowledge that um, measurement invariance checking is important, um, you should do it, then uh, I'm already very happy. Uh, thank you for your attention. Um, I'm going to go through. There is a question from Robbie. If participants are randomly assigned to the experimental and control group, is it then necessary to assess measurement invariance? Yes, um, I think so. I mean, uh, the random assignment assures that there is um, that the subjects are independent of one another, but it doesn't really uh, relate to um, the measure, I would say. I also see that Jessica is uh, typing an answer to this as well, so I'm going to leave her to it and um, I'm going to move over. Um, going to stop my share and I'm going to introduce to you the next speaker. The next speaker is Andrea Stuvebelt. Uh, Andrea Stuvebelt is a PhD student uh, and a colleague of mine uh, at Tilburg University in the Netherlands. Uh, Andrea is conducting a registered research report in stereotype threats and will be speaking to us today about that uh, and about measurement uh, issues. Andrea, please uh, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. I hope you can all hear me. Yeah. Okay, I have to have to apologize. The neighbors of the parties, if you can hear some noise in the background, that's them. Um, but today I'm going to add another concern to your research. And I'm not talking about skills, but actually the context in which we collect our data. And I would like to present to you my, uh, one of my PhD projects, which talks about bias in experimental research and the effects of time limits on gender differences. And I did this together with my two supervisors, Jelte Wiegerts and Inga Swabe. My slides. Yes. And I would like to start with this quote, namely that measurement changes the measure, and which to me this means that we should take into account the situation under which we collect our data and think about whether this situation also actually affects our measurement uh, instrument. And I would like to argue throughout this talk that yes, it does. And I'm going to motivate that with one example, namely time limits. And I can imagine that there are many other factors that may also influence. Um, how your skill functions in your sample. Time limits can be introduced in experimental research, of course, for various reasons. And then just named here too. But first of all, it's of course a practical choice. We don't have unlimited time, our participants don't have unlimited time. So we have to impose some kind of time limits to make our studies feasible. And second, we can also impose them as a design choice. I will focus on the latter because that's what I've been doing. Um, but both could be very, uh, valuable options, but they also come with some caveats. Namely, if we impose time limits, we can also create a speeded task. And in psychometrics, we generally define two types of tests. Namely, either a power test, in which we give a participant a scale, we ask them to complete all the items on the scale, and we also generally give them enough time to answer all these items. And after they're done, we just score their um, items and they're judged on how well they're doing based on the correct, uh, their number of correct answers. A speed, uh, a speed test on the other hand is a test where participants received uh, quite a lot of easy items 
and they can never finish all these items within the allotted time. And then they're not scored on how well they do on the, these items, but rather on how far they come at a scale. And these have, of course, two extremes and not a scale will not just be a power test or a speed test, but they will always be some kind of mix in between. And it doesn't have to be a problem, but it can be a problem when we introduce some kind of time limit and speed starts to become a, become a factor in our experiments, but we still want to judge our participants on how well they're doing on our scale. And we're not that interested in uh, their working speed. So if we're in such a situation, we have what we call a speeded test. And this, for example, affects uh, reliability estimates, validity estimates, and would like to focus on the validity point today. Namely, um, if we add a time limit, we introduce a speed component, and it also means that our scale is no longer uni uh, unidimensional. So for example, if we have a mathematics test and we give people enough time to answer all the, uh, these items, we can assume that our test only measures mathematics. If you just think about this very simplified. But if we introduce a time limit and a speeding component, we also measure how far participants reach in the scale. And it may be that these two factors are even correlated, that people who are better at mathematics also end up further in the scale. So we no longer have a one-dimensional scale that just means, uh, measures or, uh, or construct of interest, namely mathematics. But we have a two-dimensional scale where we uh, have both some kind of measure of working speed and ability. And to make matters worse, uh, gender differences also come into play. So we not only now have a scale that doesn't measure one thing anymore, but may measure two things, we also artificially introduce differences across groups. And these uh, gender differences in speed tests have been found on, for example, numerical reasoning tasks, cognitive tasks, and university exams. And I'm going to add like social psychological experiments to this. And I'm going to use some stereotype threat data um, to illustrate all of this later. But in general, the takeaway message from this is that we do find gender differences on all these tasks if they're performed under time limits. And that, for example, for numerical reasoning, this difference between genders um, is reduced when this time limit is removed. So what we do we do? We have two problems. We have our speed test that we um, administered on a too strict time limit. So we know that we probably have two dimensions in our data, namely working speed and ability. And we also know that we have some kind of gender issue going on, maybe. And I would argue that we cannot uh, not just ignore all these issues and fit our ANOVA model and analyze the data, but rather we should explicitly model this mechanism, uh, missing mechanism. And that's what is that is what I set out to do. And for that, I used the two-dimensional parameter item response model uh, proposed by Glas and Pimentel in 2008. And that's a lot of words to just say that I used a model that can model both these latent traits I just talked about. So it can model both mathematics ability, missing this propensity, and also the correlation between these two traits. So we can see whether indeed people who are better at mathematics are also able to answer more items within the allotted time. And the nice thing about these models is that they're very flexible, so we can also add covariates. And in my study, I add the gender, um, which can add anything you want. So, and if you look at this in a picture, it would look a bit like this. We have our observed gender variable, the two latent traits, mathematics ability, and missing this propensity. And here I have to add that missing this propensity is a bit of a misnomer because it's not actually how much items you miss, but more your tendency to respond to items. So it's uh, phrased the, uh, the wrong way around and that's sometimes a bit confusing. But in general, the higher you're missing this propensity, the more likely you are to answer an item. And your mathemat uh, mathematics ability reflects how good you are at mathematics. So the higher your ability is here, the more likely you will answer mathematics items correctly. And we propose that gender negatively influence both of these uh, latent traits. Um, a negative effect for gender on mathematics ability based on the observed literature, where we certainly do observe a gender gap, and a negative effect on missingness propensity due to um, the other literature, mostly from intelligence research, that does suggest that there are 
um, there's a difference in which men and women answer items. And uh, we developed these models and we wanted to apply them to a second large project of my PhD, namely a registered replication report on stereotype threat, with which we collected quite a lot of cool data. But um, for that, I would like to give some background on these data. And namely, we have stereotype threats, which is a social psychological construct to also that also tries to explain gender differences in mathematics. And the idea is that this gender difference is created due to stereotypes about women's mathematics performance. So the idea is, for example, like this Barbie, women can't do math, we rather should go shopping and not be concerned with any STEM related things. And because then women, when they are confronted with a mathematics test, the stereotype is activated and their performance suffers. In the lab, that would look something like this. So for example, on the left side, we have the stereotype threat condition where we would tell women, well, girls really suck at math. And on the right side, we have some kind of control group where we don't tell women this. And what's expected is that the women in the stereotype threat condition then underperform compared to men, whereas women in the control condition perform similar to men. Um, there's quite a lot of literature on this, but like I said, we did an RR on this and that's probably, um, we did that because there's probably publication bias in this literature, some false positives, and we tried to figure out whether we can replicate a stereotype threat effect if we do that with a large group of people. And we were very happy and very hard working on this, and then the crisis hit. So currently I have four samples, but we're still very happy with the data we have, and we still managed to uh, collect data from about 800 participants, about 600 women, 180 men. And I'm really thankful to all these participants and my co authors on the bottom of the slides for all their hard work and that we still made this work despite the corona crisis. But this crisis hasn't been nice to us, but we also haven't been very nice to our participants. We gave them a mathematics test and we gave them only 20 minutes to complete these 30 items. So they have less than one minute per question. It was pretty rough. And I also heard from a lot of them that they didn't find it very nice to be able to, do, uh, to have to do this under such a time limit. But this also um, caused us to have a heavy speed test. And I also still want to share the results of the RR with you that we have until now. Um, this is Cohen's D. And negative values mean um, that the people in a stereotype threat condition score lower than the people in a control condition when we have a look at women only. So after all our work, uh, this was what we have until now. And I hope that we can add a lot of labs later on still in the future when we are allowed to go outside again. But now back to measurement and why we're all here. We didn't find these effects of stereotype threat on the performance of women, which is in line with the pre-registered studies that are currently in the literature. And we decided um, to have a look for exp uh, alternative explanations. And we came up with a couple of the standard ones, like a limited sample, maybe p-hacking, maybe publication bias, but we also thought maybe it might be our own experimental setup because 30 items in 20 minutes is very limited. And maybe this is some type of effect uh, on our participants' behavior. And we do found um, that these uh, strict time limits are very common within stereotype threat research. A lot of studies include such time limits that participants have less than one minute um, to answer a question. And it also results in a lot of missing data, which also, uh, and with which we also found that larger numbers of missing data have been related to larger stereotype threat effects. So basically, the more missing data you have in your study, the larger your effect size will be. And we wondered, maybe there's some kind of double mechanism going on. Maybe um, these women in the stereotype threat condition do not only suffer from a stereotype threat manipulation, but also from this gender difference that we find in their time limits. And then we end up back at our model situation. I used the same models that I discussed completely at the beginning, 
these, these models of which we are allowed uh, able to model multiple latent traits, like so, like here, working speed and mathematics ability, as we're also able to include covariates. And on this uh, picture to the right, I included the stereotype threat manipulation, which is a negative effect on the relationship between gender and mathematics ability and gender and missingness propensity. And I tried to fit four models, but it turned out to be quite difficult. These uh, item response models are very difficult to estimate and have a hard time converging. So the idea was very nice, and this is what we pre-registered to do, but the reality turned out a bit different. First, we started with some descriptives, because that always works. And here we can uh, already see that there's a relationship between the amount of items that people attempt to do and the amount of items they also answer correctly. And on the top of the slide with the women and on the bottom of the slide with the men. And these pink bars are the number of responses to an item. So we didn't have a look if they were correct or incorrect, but just whether people answered an item. And we can see that the pink bars slowly decrease over the test length, which makes sense. Because um, they only had 20 minutes, so after a while people start dropping out where people in the beginning still answer items, but very, uh, towards the end they don't anymore. But we also see that the blue bars uh, follow these pink bars quite well. We can see that people who do answer the items towards the end of the test also answer them correctly, which indicates to us that if people uh, answer a lot of items towards the end, they're not randomly guessing anymore. They're also actually able to answer them still uh, to uh, their ability. And we also find this in, the, in our results. In our table, if you notice, model four is dropped because it didn't converge. Um, but we did find a correlation, a positive correlation between missingness, propensity, and ability, which means that the more able students were able to answer more items. And we also found this effect of gender or missingness propensity. But as you can see, um, this interval, and for sure the uh, upper bound of the interval is very, very close to zero. So I wouldn't put any money on this because it might be that if you drop a participant or we run the model with slightly different settings or different priors, that so we get a different result. But we do have an indication that something might be there. So we have some results. We know that um, there is this correlation between missingness propensity and ability, and that there may be an effect of gender. So what now? First of all, I would like to see a replication of this. My data are very limited. And there's, for example, no stereotype threat effects uh, on the sum scores in these data. And it would be cool to replicate this type of uh, modeling approach to a stereotype threat data set that does have an effect in it. Only up to my knowledge, there's certainly no data set large enough to try this with uh, currently available. And the effect may be stronger in the US. Like we only use European samples and it may be that we could find a stereotype threat effect when we use a different type of sample. And if we try this and maybe we still don't recover it, it may be time to study other reasons beyond stereotype threats in social psychology to study why there might be a performance gap between men and women. And to get back to measurements and to remove a bit away from stereotype threats, I also have two slides I would like you to remember from all of this, because I talked a lot about stereotype threat, but this of course applies to all other fields that have some kind of experimental task uh, with a time limit attached to it. We do find some indications in my study, also, but, but also across the literature, that ability and missing this propensity are correlated. And thus, that we cannot just ignore a missing data mechanism. And um, because these, are, uh, these two uh, latent traits are correlated, our missing data is no longer ignorable, and we have to do something with it to avoid, for example, having biased parameter estimates. In the case of IRT, this may result to the underestimation of people's scores or wrong conclusions about how your test functions in your sample. And I would like to argue that indeed measurement does change the measure. Time limits may affect the conclusions we can draw for research. And even though we install them maybe at the beginning of our study without giving them much thought, they may actually impact the conclusions we can draw at the end of them. And I think we then in the end have two options. 
we could try this modeling approach, which is maybe a bit post hoc. Like we have our data, we know that there's a big caveat in it because we have a lot of missing data we cannot impute or ignore. And we can use very difficult models um, to still find um, the relationship we origin were originally looking for, which for me uh, was a stereotype threat effect. Um, but we can also um, take the other approach and take this into account at the beginning of our study, but we're still designing it. And there I wonder, and I'm going to contradict Esther a bit, um, whether we actually need all the items that we plan to um, uh, administer. And I don't say just drop items from a validated scale, but for me, I, I use the mathematics that has not been validated. And maybe I could have used less and still got the same result. Or maybe we give participants just a bit more time to answer all the items. And that would be my takeaway. Please think about their setup of your study beforehand. And if you can't do so, take the choices you made into account when you draw your conclusions. And I still, sorry, Esther, I want to plug myself. <laughs> um, all these uh, projects are openly available for the RR, the pre-registration, the data code and manuscript are available online. And for my missing data study, the pre-registration data and model codes are also available. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrea. Sorry for interrupting you uh, quickly. Um, I am... Um... I think your uh, final um, note on the number of items is very interesting. I think we can have an interesting discussion on this, uh, on being able to leave out items. Uh, sounds very interesting. I'm not going to delve into it now. I'm going to go to the question that was asked in the Q&A. Um, on a very principal level, does it make sense to measure ability independently of time? Is ability always, is not ability always achievement over time? I have to think about this question a bit. It's a hard one, I would say. Yeah. Um, there's, of course, always a bit of a time um, component to ability, because the way I see it, we can never create a skill that all people will be able to complete within a reasonable time limit. So there's always choices there that, um, on the one hand, you want to give people enough time, but on the other hand, you also uh, want to keep it practical. So there will always be some people where you'll keep this speed accuracy trade-off. So I find it a bit difficult to answer this. I think ability will always be related to your working speed, but we can try to minimize this as much as possible by creating good skills. Thank you. Okay, I'm going, we're going to move on to our final speaker of the symposium. Um, so Dr. sharing Jessica, my screen. Yeah, thank you. Um, Dr. Jessica Flake uh, is an assistant professor in quantitative psychology at McGill University in Canada. Um, she will be talking today about uh, threats to the validity of replication research, as if you haven't heard enough already. Um, she investigated with her team uh, studies from the reproducibility project psychology in many labs too. Um, Jessica, if you're ready, uh, please go for it. Yeah, so hopefully um, you guys see screen two, which has a chat box, but I'm gonna take the chat box off. So now you see um, the display version over there and I'm gonna give myself the extra slide. Okay, all good with the, uh, okay, yep, okay. Um, yeah, so I broke all the rules and forgot to add the meta science slide. I'm really sorry. Thank you to everybody else. Um, and also, I'm excited to talk to you guys about some. I, I talk about these issues a lot, usually to quant folks or to social folks, but like there are people here that are interested in meta science. So we can talk about meta science and measurement at the same time. Um, and I'm going to talk about uh, measurement practice in the time of replication crisis. Obviously, we're all living through a different crisis, and it. It was, um, you know, we've been about having maybe a little bit of a break from the replication crisis because we're living in a pandemic. So I do want to acknowledge that. Um, so I don't have a ton of time, but my plan is to provide a little bit of background and then to focus on measurement practices and how they connect with replication research and close out with what I hope is um, heartening next steps of how we can uh, replace maybe large scale replications with large scale measurement studies. 
So background, what is construct validity and how does it relate to methodological reform? So we've talked a lot about actually, uh, there are uh, clearly measurement walks here. Um, I'm gonna talk really big picture. I'm not gonna get into the details, but generally there's just this idea in psychology that we're measuring things that are inside of people's heads. We don't know how to measure them. We don't know how to elicit the behaviors that will give us some indication of what these things inside people's heads are. We do this a lot of different ways, but what happens is we get some number in our data set. And the goal is that the number, it has some meaning. So if my motivation is higher than somebody else, my score on that number is also higher. This is what construct validity is about. It's about the meaning of scores, tracking the constructs that we wish to measure. And there are a lot of different ways to think about measurement to define construct validity. There are standards uh, for measurement um, in the North American tradition. Also, there are European standards. There are books of construct validity theory and psychometric methods. I'm not going to explain all the details, but I would say the short of it is that we have this challenge with measurement, which is that it's very theoretical. So you have to think, you have to know what you want to measure before you can decide how to measure it. And then once you decide how to measure it, there's all the statistical modeling stuff you have to do, and it's it's quite complicated. We've been talking a lot about psychometrics here today. Um, you don't have to maybe know all the details of all the different ways to measure, but I think the takeaway is that there's a lot of stuff to do to make sure that when you interpret that number, it does impart the meaning that you think it imparts. So I'm going to define construct validity as the degree to which evidence and theory support the interpretation of tests and scores for the proposed uses of tests. There are other definitions you might um, use, but in general, we can think about validity pertaining to the interpretation and use of a score and something that's really important is not necessarily a stable property of the instrument. So you measure, and, and we've all kind of been saying that throughout this talk, because of measurement invariance, because of the context you measure, just because the instrument had some properties before, doesn't mean it's gonna have those properties that give you the interpretation you want later. So evidence should be gathered in an ongoing way, and there should be theoretical and quantitative evidence. This is the standard construct validity stuff that you think about um, when you learn about research design, when you learn about measurement. It is particularly relevant to replication research in a way that I think has been neglected. So there has been a replication crisis, which has spurred a methodological reform movement, and the whole focus of the crisis is whether or not our conclusions of our studies are valid. So we say there's some effect. Is there really effect? Is that the truth? Is that a valid conclusion? And there have been a lot of discussions about how to make sure our conclusions are more valid or more replicable um, because our statistical practices were bad. So people were p-hacking, they were hypothesizing after results are known, engaging in selective reporting and questionable research practices. So methodological reformers, myself included, swooped in and they were like, we can solve this problem. We're going to pre-register. We're not going to have um, as much analytical flexibility by coming up with a new publication model called a register report. We're going to plan our sample sizes better. We're going to be more transparent and we're going to conduct a lot of replication research. And that's all great. I'm a big supporter of that. Something that isn't um, in those conversations is this more foundational or fundamental role of measurement. This is also things like research design, theoretical expertise, and from what everyone was saying before, and luckily I don't have to say much about it, um, there are a lot of problems here at these foundational aspects of the research process. So there are a lot of questionable measurement practices. There are a lot of instruments in use without any validity evidence. And so if, our, if we're going to start replicating research as a way to understand how valid our conclusions are, we have a lot of research is sort of cracked from the bottom. So the general background is that there is Evidence of construct validity is necessary to interpret a study. Questionable and bad measurement practices are common. There has been a replication crisis, which spurred a methodological reform movement. But the reform movement needs to address measurement practices because we got a lot of problems going on and because we need good measurement practices to ensure that our studies are valid and that our studies are replicable. So let's talk about actual replication research. I'm going to share with you two systematic reviews of replication research that I've conducted, the Reproducibility Project Psychology and the Many Labs 2. So the first one I'm going to talk about is the Reproducibility Project Psychology. Um, perhaps many of you have heard of this study as a part of the hosts uh, for this conference. 
but um, the Center for Open Science attempted to replicate 100 studies taking, taken from prominent journals in psychology, and they were direct replications. So they were meant to be as close to the originals as possible. So like use the same exact materials. And there was um, a, you know, a good faith effort to power the studies or to make sure that the materials were there. So we reviewed all the original studies and all the replication reports. And we looked for things like, what were the measures? Did the measures have a citation to a validity study? Were there any psychometric analyses? And I'm going to focus on item based scales like questionnaires and surveys, um, because best practices for validation are straightforward and I know about them. Um, and I will say that the this paper is under review. It is a request for revision, but it's a toughie. So I don't know if it'll be published anytime soon. So basically, we looked at all of the original studies and all of their instruments. We found 362 instruments and 53% of those were item based scales. So that means that a primary variable of interest that they were measuring was measured with a survey or a questionnaire. Half of those surveys and questionnaires were only one item. This is common, one item uh, measurement is common. 44% of those item based scales had no reference to a source. So they appeared to come out of nowhere, or uh, they were ad hoc, or they were created on the fly. 56% had some citation. So you can make a generous assumption that that citation is to a validity study. 55% of the item-based scales had a reliability coefficient. 20% were reported with no information at all. So my appraisal of this situation is that the original studies Many of the instruments didn't have any validity evidence. They didn't have basic information about their psychometric properties. So what happens in a replication study when the original research lacks validity evidence? Well, first, it's not standard practice for replicators to report any psychometric information in replication reports. So less than half of the replication reports reported any even reliability. Uh, information, and only a few reported any other psychometric analyses. So one way you could interpret this is that replication studies have even less validity evidence than original studies. 16 of the 100 studies, the authors actually explicitly said there seems to be some problem here with, with the measurement. So in looking across all of the studies and all of the instruments and this lack of validity, we summarize this into four broad challenges that replicators are going to face from a measurement perspective. That's limited information about measures, no or limited validity evidence for measures, measurement differences from original to replication, and then a more severe measurement difference, which is translation. I'm just going to give you a quick example for each of these from the reproducibility project. So for example, in replication study 46, in the original study, the, there wasn't a lot of transparency. The item wordings were unclear. So the replication study actually ended up using different items. Limit or no validity evidence is just a lack of information. So you have a lot of ad hoc instruments with no validation. This is just sort of a case where the foundation of the original study is really shaky. I think of this as potentially replicating garbage. So you have instruments with no validity evidence and now you've gone through and you're spending resources and time to replicate those studies. Even for instruments with or without validity evidence, you're going to see measurement differences. So, for example, in the 92nd study, the reliability in the replication was so low as to be unacceptable. Um, or in study 41, two items were significantly and strongly correlated in the original. They were not even significantly correlated in the replication study. Sometimes you see different factor structures. And then translation. Uh, which is a more extreme version of a measurement difference. So 40 scales were translated in the RPP um, and only eight of them had previous validated or tr the translated instruments that had uh, undergone some sort of validation process. I can't say how many of those translated instruments were not invariant or had psychometric uh, differences across groups, but we do know that positive and negative affect schedule was used in two of the studies and there are published studies showing um, language and cultural differences. So there's a reason to think that when we do these replication studies, we're going to have measurement non invariance due to translation issues and or cultural issues. So measurement introduces a lot of challenges in the conduct planning and interpretation of replication research. 
Sometimes it makes direct replication impossible because the original measurement was so intransparent, you can't figure out what happened. Sometimes the replication study just inherits a bunch of flaws that the original has, so lack of construct validity evidence. Or sometimes the psychometric results really conflict with the original. And now you're left with this question, well, what does it mean in my replication study if I didn't replicate the fact that the items were correlated? What do I do next? From the RPP, it appears that multiple measures produce invalid or not comparable scores from the original. Like they're not comparable to the original study or they're not valid in the replication study. But for many, it's unknown. I mean, even though the RPP data are open, they're really limited in sample size because they're powered to detect usually a simple statistical effect, whereas a psychometric analysis might uh, estimate dozens of parameters. I think this is just something we need to think about when we run replications. If we want to go backwards and do measurement research, we need way bigger sample sizes than when we tend to power a replication study. So we went looking in the Minilabs 2. The Minilabs 2 is a little bit different than the RPP because it's bigger sample sizes. So the Minilabs projects will pick a set of effects and have a bunch of labs run that same study um, in a slate. So more samples and bigger samples, but a lot of language heterogeneity. So um, for the mini labs, two instruments were translated into 16 languages. There are open data, and because there's all the different data collection labs, there are data that are large enough for some instruments, for some um, groups to evaluate the factor structure that was assumed by the replication study and evaluate um, the reliability in the replication sample. So this paper is published as led by my graduate student, Mairead Shaw. So uh, she deserved all the credit. So we did, of course, look at all the measures. So we looked at how many measures there were and if they had any validity evidence. Um, then what we really were focused on was which instruments we could actually do a little bit of psychometric testing for. So test their assumed factor structure and test their reliability. I will say that the review of instruments, just what the instruments were like, if they had any validity evidence, if they had any reliability evidence, they're very consistent with what other people have saying here. So a lot of ad hoc or on the fly instruments, a lot of instruments with limited validity evidence and a high uh, prevalence of one item scales. So of all these instruments, um, eight of them had more than three items. So what we did was we looked to see if the replication study used assumed a single factor model. And then we tested whether or not that single matter factor model fit the data across the whole replication sample. This involves confirmatory factor analysis and structural equation modeling, sometimes with categorical outcomes, sometimes with continuous outcomes. You don't have to know much about that, but you do have to trust me. So I would say in general, the results of these models are mediocre. Some we might say are acceptable, but there's at least three in this study that most of us would agree are really unacceptable. So the idea that these instruments measured a single factor and that a total score would represent the data and produce a valid score is not really tenable. So when we run a single factor CFA, we want decent model fit. We can argue about what decent model fit is, but we would all agree that an RMSCA 0.26 is bad. You want that number to at least be less than 0.10. CFI and TLI, you want to be close to one. These are not close to one at all. We've got some, you know, kind of this one, this one's, but that RMSCA is terrible. So we have multiple instruments in this large scale replication study for which um, dozens of labs contributed and spent time and resources when the instruments themselves don't even produce a unidimensional model, which is assumed. Another thing that we looked at was reliability. So even though we didn't meet assumptions for reliability, we looked at the reliability estimate for all of these instruments. Um, on average, reliability is lower than we would like it to be. Uh, reliability does influence the ability to detect a, an effect, so that's a problem. And labs vary in how reliable their data are. And translated uh, scales have lower reliability on average. So this is just one of the instruments. These are just Chromebox Alpha. The labs are organized on the y-axis. We have translated instruments here and untranslated instruments here. The average Chromebox Alpha for this instrument is a below 0.5. But what you can see is that um, translated instruments are more variable in their reliability, and their reliability is lower. So this is a key source of heterogeneity in the instruments. Yet these data are pooled often to interpret replicated effects. OK, so the takeaways are that direct replication research is a, uh, on a large scale is becoming a norm. Replication research is stymied by pervasive QMPs in the original literature, questionable measurement practices. 
Constant validity evidence and replication research is entirely missing or it's not supported by the data. And replication research isn't valid or interpretable under these conditions. And I will make a strong stance. I don't think replication results are valid or interpretable when we have all these measurement issues going on. That's pretty sad. It's a pretty, uh, well, it keeps us busy. I think the good way to think about it is that these replication studies have contributed a lot to our understanding about how to do replication research. And because all the data are open and we're working together on this, we're gonna be able to solve the problem. So let's talk about next steps. I think that what we can do is conduct large scale construct validation instead of large scale replications. So what I said earlier is that replication research isn't valid or interpretable under these conditions. So one of the things that we can do is improve the transparency and the rigor of original research. That's a long term goal, but we should get right on it. We could only select studies to replicate that have strong validity evidence for the measures. So basically, we shouldn't waste our time trying to replicate garbage. I would say this is my view, but there is a counter argument to this, which is important, which is that replication can help us identify garbage and that failed replications are a more effective way to correct the literature than commentaries or methodological critiques. Like, does anybody care when we write a paper and say that instrument was bad? It doesn't seem like it. But when there's a massive failed replication, people listen. Let's compromise and say that why don't we conduct replication studies differently? We can add that psychometric and construct validation uh, aspect to the replication process. So I'm working on this with the Psychological Science Accelerator, which is a distributed laboratory network that runs large scale and collaborative studies, often replication studies. Anybody can become a member, so go ahead to the website and join. We'll run a really big study and then we'll pull the data to estimate bigger effects or we'll do replications where we can estimate effects on a more global scale. So something that I've been working on is using a PSA study as a test case to develop a construct validation pipeline that we can adopt when we run large scale replication studies. The pipeline goes something like this and I am aware of the time. So we're gonna translate the instruments and we're gonna get some qualitative feedback from the translators. Then we're going to do basic item level descriptive analyses, look at the factor structure and reliability within groups. This could be at the lab level or at the language level. I've been focusing on the language level right now. Conduct measurement and, and variance testing, particularly for translated versions compared to the original version, determine the level of invariance. Use the qualitative information from translators to identify partial measurement and variance models and anchor, anchor items. And then if there's configural invariance, which is that the factor configuration of the items to factors is the same across groups, uh, use, use a multiple group model and alignment analysis but importantly, since open data is something that we always have as a result of these studies, produce a validity report for each version that runs through this process so that when people reuse the data or they interpret the replications, they have all that psychometric and validity information that they need. The goal really is to produce a psychometric pipeline that we can all use so that we can improve the evidence that we get from large scale replication studies. So my takeaways are that measurement practices are questionable and bad in the original literature, and this is really problematic for replication research. Large scale replication research is gonna require new methods and new research practices. I can't even figure out how to do some of the stuff that we wanna do. Um, but right now it kind of seems like replication studies have even less validity evidence than original studies. The generalization of constructs and measures is a key issue for methodological reform, and it's a part of how we can understand the replicability of findings. It would be worthwhile for future large scale studies to focus more on the constructs and less on replicating specific examples uh, of experiments. So that's what we're working on at the PSA. I'm gonna shut it down there because I think I'm over on time. Thank you, uh, Jessica. Uh, I very much like the idea of a psychometric pipeline. Mm -hmm. uh, very appealing. Um, there is uh, one question in the Q&A. Um, it is about translated scales. Do you have any ideas why translated scales are less reliable? Could it be that the scale was not translated in consultation with members of the community? Yeah, so um, translation will go differently in these studies. So there are some backwards, forwards and review translation techniques used in some of the studies. Um, and I think in the mini labs, you could think of that process as getting better than in the RPP, like a little more rigorous. But I think the translated scales are less reliable because translated items are poorly understood 
by them. I think that um, despite really rigorous translation methods, items can still not quite translate to the people who are reading them. So we have seen with really rigorous, in, in the PSA, with really rigorous forwards and backwards translation and item review, that when we go and ask a native speaker to just read it again and give us feedback, they will identify problematic items. Um, and even if the translation might make sense, it might psychometrically not be equivalent to the original item, which may have had imparted some cultural meaning. Um, so I think that that's what's going on. I think that it's possible, actually, my negative take is that it's not possible to translate all instruments because constructs don't exist the same way that they exist in the in the language that they were created. So we want to measure happiness over here in Canada and we go and try to measure it in another culture. It's just not even the same thing. So it doesn't matter if you translate the items. But I do think that for some constructs that we think have a global or cultural relevance more broadly, it's possible to make validated and like translated items that are going to um, be interpretable equally, but that takes a lot more work than just having a couple people translate it. We have to, like, this is what PISA and TEMS do, right? They spend a lot of time making sure the items are equivalent and it's a mixed methods process. Um, should I look at Wes's uh, question? Okay, uh, hey, out there. Um, so have you considered the role of fitting propensity as advanced by your colleague Carl? Within this work, some models will yield good fit in original replicated systems because those models have inherent to fit well to any possible data. I don't know when I see for propensity, I kind of feel like a propensity score. So I'm not actually sure what you're referring to here. Maybe I'm not familiar with these models. Um, like bias vector models tend to uh, fit really well on most data, for example. Like there's just SEM models that overfit data. I think that's the idea. Of the, yeah. The I mean, that I, I, if that's happening, that's a little bit different than none of the models fit at all, not even a little tiny bit, not even a little, which seems to be the um, modal outcome of these analyses. So it doesn't, you know, models that fit really well for some sort of like reason because they're very complex or, or whatever. Um, if they have the inherent tendency to fit any data, I'm not sure. That doesn't appear to represent the bulk of what's going on. That could be like a, a ladder stream issue that we could think about, though. I think, of course, whether or not a factor model fit doesn't necessarily mean that it's, you know, that the scores are valid and that the construct makes sense and people interpreted the items the way you think. So there's definitely a lot of room for issues there. But I would say that's going to be advanced. Right now, we're working on instrument. Has ever even anyone ever thought about it before? They published all of their items and some reasonable background information. I mean, we're working on very low level things now because all the advanced stuff, that, and when I say we, I mean the whole field should maybe think about it this way. All the advanced stuff that we were working on almost seems irrelevant uh, given the state of reporting. So maybe we can advance to that later, Wes. Thanks. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Jessica. I wanna... Um thank uh, all of our speakers. Uh, I want to thank the organizers. Uh, and of course, I want to thank the attendees here. Uh, if you have any questions uh, for us, if we missed your question, if you want to know something more than um, if you want to interact with us, feel free to reach out um, to us via other channels. Uh, I think we are all very easily findable on the internet. Mm -hmm. um, there's also the Slack and the Remo available to you, of course. Um, there are no more questions here. So, uh, and we're also running out of time. So I would like to um, close this session. Thank everyone again. Um, hope to see you around here somewhere uh, later during a session, maybe. And um, well, let's thank Esther for organizing us. Thanks for having thank us so here. Much. Thanks, Esther. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, um, Esther.